what is the definition of investing? The definition of an investment operation is one which guarantees secures the safety of principle and adequate return, right? So you think about what that means, right? What typical asset class has this characteristic of safety of principle and an adequate return? Right? FD it, or bonds, uh. Correct. It's like a bond, isn't it? So what he is really looking for is a stock which behaves like a bond, right? But of course, necessarily there will be some higher risk involved uh, and higher returns. Right. But he is still prioritizing the safety of principle and note the words he used, he used adequate return. Yeah. Right. What do most equity investors look for? It's ma- maximum, maximum return. returns. <laughs> right? Yeah. Maximum with returns and you know, sometimes we don't even think about safety of principle, correct? When you talk yeah. about stocks, right? right? Yeah. right. So right. it's almost the flip side of things. So according to Graham's interpretation of uh, an investment, right, as opposed to a speculation, uh, you really need to prioritize safety of principle. Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part? It's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www.firl.co slash f-r-e-e or www.firl.co slash free. Hello everyone, Uh, welcome back to the FIRO Podcast, best place for long-term stock investor. Today we have uh, quite an old friend, right? Old in uh, MCO terms, right? MCO terms, We got to know him during MCO, (laughs) so I consider that uh, very, very long. Um, But at the same time, it feels like it's, uh, you know, uh, we've met each other only uh, yesterday, right? There's a... There's a quote I remember, right? Days few long, few days uh, can feel long, but then years uh, fly. So, um, yeah, today we're gonna talk about stocks. We're gonna talk about macroeconomics. We're gonna talk about, I think, a very interesting take on value investing. That's the agenda for the podcast today, and we have uh, an enthusiast, right? I will call him an enthusiast. I think I'll leave it uh, to him to describe his uh, position and where he has come from. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Mr. Aaron Pack. Yeah, hi guys. Nice to meet you. I mean, ni- thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, nice, yeah. yeah, nice to meet no, you it, again. Yeah, it feels like yesterday, right, Aaron? <laughs> uh, I still yeah, remember yeah. when I first met you guys, right? Wow, that was like, like you uh, said, years are long. Uh. Yeah. Hey, I don't, don't, was... don't, don't say when, uh, later people catch that there is a period where we sh- cannot meet physically, one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, it's about 1985, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around yeah. That, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Aaron, I think uh, like most of our guests, we just want, and I know you you do listen to our podcast, so you know basically how it how it rolls. And I just want to start off with, I think your relationship with money, and then move on to your relationship with investing, uh, in the stock market or investing in general, right? So, what was a seven year old Aaron like with, when it comes to money, or teenage uh, Aaron? Walk me through like your your journey. Yeah, sure. So my introduction with investing really started because I was interested in uh, business quite iron- ironically because my dad was a, a semi-successful businessman. So I've always wanted to walk in his footsteps. But, uh, you know, as a, a rather reservist guy, I realized that business may not be for me because it's uh, it's, it's very high risk, right? It's high risk, high reward. You can basically do very well or you can go bankrupt overnight. Mm. So um, <clears throat> there was a dichotomy despite it being uh, my interest. Uh, so when I found value investing, it actually really caught my attention right, and hooked me, hooked me in because you are basically investing in businesses. The strategic considerations are all pretty much the same as what a high level businessman would do, right? would think about on a day-to-day basis. The, 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 the large cap entrepreneur is not moving uh, inventory around, correct? So, uh, and at the same time, you can manage your risk because you can diversify, you can uh, do many other things, right? So, uh, it's the best of both bo- 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 for me. And uh, from then on, I was just hooked. Uh. I see. 
Right. So, uh, so it basically, if I summarize it, basically, you initially you thought you wanted to be an astronaut. Now you're an astronomer, lah. Basically, I I actually did want to be an astronaut when I was seven. Right. 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 So the the businessman thing came around fifteen. So I did actually didn't answer your question properly. Right. <laughs> okay. 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 Interesting. <laughs> well, you answered you answered you answered my question in two two different ways. Very interesting. So, uh, okay. So now then you get into contact you get the investing bug right uh and you know walk through some of your, your career basically right uh how, how has it been like actually starting to gain practical experience in the investing field okay so i guess what your viewers might be interested to learn in is more on the uh practical aspects of it uh, i have about five years of uh research experience right uh on the equity side Although I do uh, also have personal interest in fixed income and macro. Uh, as far as learning is concerned, uh, there is quite a bit of difference between the institutional uh, practice as well as the compared to the retail practice or the individual practice. Because on the institutional side, you do have to worry about drawdowns. You have to worry about volatility. Right? These are, uh, for better or worse, these metrics are uh, important in the institutional world. Whereas in the retail world, it's not so relevant, or at least not as relevant as returns. So uh, you do pick up a few skills here and there, uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question. Feel free to, to step in. But uh, basically, you learn quite a bit about how the finance side works, right? It's uh, obviously networking is important, but it's really not just about uh, people's skills, right? You do need technical skills. So, uh, especially when you're learning things like macro, learning things like portfolio management, you can get incredibly uh, technical at times, uh, to the point of, almost to the point of redundancy sometimes. So, so right. correct, go ahead. No, so I, I just want to understand, uh, how has the evolution been like for you, right? So you, 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 kept, you caught the bug, then you entered the industry. I would assume that you are not the same Aaron today as you were five years ago or whenever you started in the industry so uh, has there been an, an arc or an evolution yeah sure so like uh like i said i actually got interested in value investing right at the beginning which is the warren buffett style uh investing in good businesses investing in compounders uh over time i also was forced in my job to develop skills of uh, I would say contemporary finance, right? Your CFA finance, portfolio management, and also having a deep understanding of macroeconomics, which um, I'm sure uh, most of you guys would also know is not really the Warren Buffett style. So I guess uh, it complements, but it does not replace. Understand. Um, more for more for the retail audience out there. In a way, a lot of. Uh, most most of the time when you they go to these market outlook sessions, especially you know retail investors, they love those uh, free market outlook uh, kind of talks by the by the brokers, right? And they 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 are actually bombarded with a lot of economic data, leading indicators, coincident. And how does the retail is it one is how does the retail investor actually uh, grasp all this? Secondly, is it really really necessary for investing success for the retail investor? I mean, in your point. Sure. So to answer your first question, Howard Marks, as you know, is a very famous value investor in the US uh, running Oak Tree Capital Management. He actually, in his books, he says as well that uh, you can't really gain an advantage in macro. It's not that you don't have to understand. It's just that the ability to master... <coughs> sorry. The ability to master it is so um, um, difficult that uh, you can't gain a competitive advantage over your peers, right? Most people are just um, simply unable to be good at macro uh, because first of all, it needs to be knowable and second of all, you need to, be, you need to have some sort of superior uh, uh, advantage, right? Whether it's analytical or from uh, better information flow. So with macro, anything in the world can happen, right? Look at the past three years. We went up and down, up and down, up and down. I mean, <laughs> right? So... Um, you can't know the future because it hasn't existed yet. And because there are so many, there are literally a hundred moving parts in macro, uh, you can't gain a superior interpretation of the information. So right. I'm not saying that you, it's not important, it definitely is, but um, 
you can't really gain a competitive advantage in terms of returns of it. So what would be your best way to explain the differences between the Warren Buffett style investing and the so-called macro investing? Because I think at least in this part of the world, uh, macro investing, people might think it's all like analyzing politics or like uh, GDPs and whatnot. So how, how would you make that distinction? Sure. Uh, so I'll try to keep it brief. In value investing, you really um, focus, I would say, almost exclusively on the fundamentals. So for instance, if you were to analyze Air Asia, you'll be... Uh, by the way, please do check out uh, Firo's, uh interview with Shukor right, a, a few days or weeks ago. It's a very good uh, primer on the airline industry. Uh, but yeah, you, you're basically just understanding the things that the CEO is in control of, right? For instance, your fuel costs, your staff costs, your uh, ticket pricing, stuff like this. But in terms of macro, um, I guess the way I would uh, describe it in an actionable way is that CEOs do need to care about macro as well, right? So for instance, Air Asia CEO, definitely COVID hurt, hurts him a lot, right? And uh, politics also does play a role in it. But uh, the so-called macro investors who exclusively focus on macro, Right. They are really talking in terms of like where is the trajectory of the US economy grow, uh, going towards? What is the US and China trade tensions like? What are export import figures? Right? Um, inflation, uh, central bank policy. These things are, you can almost say they are the fundamentals of countries as opposed to fundamentals of companies. And you can imagine that the typical country is at least 100 times bigger than a typical company. So, uh, yeah, it's really not inaccurate to say you're analyzing the fundamentals of a country, right? But uh, because there's the interdynamic, your Malaysia's competitor is Indonesia and Singapore, right? Mm. And then you also have the big guys at like US and so if you think in terms of uh, uh, let's say a small bank like uh, Bank Islam versus Maybank, Malaysia is like Bank Islam and then US is like uh, Maybank. So, uh, yeah, uh, you got to, it's not just knowing one country's fundamentals is knowing every country's fundamentals right. and their their interdynamics right uh it's impossible to get any certainty on it right right so I, I will definitely come back to macro later on and how you see it because i know that um, at least my understanding on macro is that uh you know many people have many different opinions right about the dollar about gold or whatever so i think let's zoom into value investing because for most people, value investing means, let's say, low PE or high returns on capital. And what I find interesting about value investing, and you know, when we go through uh, our podcast, I think we have like twenty over podcasts right now. Uh, most of them would be would consider themselves uh, disciples, or at least they have a lot of reverence for someone like Warren Buffett. So the word value investing is also associated to Warren Buffett. But I know you have a, a, a unique take on value investing and I think it's it's also quite nicely spelled out uh, on your blog, which by the way, whoever listening can go check it out. Um, so how do you understand value investing? Because when I ask 10 different people, I get 11 different answers. Sure. So it's, a, it's actually a very excellent question. I've actually spent a long time trying to figure out how to communicate right, value investing to a layman or someone who just first time introduced to it. And I've never been able to communicate uh, in a very good way uh, previously because when you tell somebody that it's long-term fundamental focus, right, it sounds almost cliche right? because you've heard it so many times. But here's how I describe it. Value investing is simply buying something for less than it's worth. Right? So it's not about the value factor, which is buying a low earnings multiple stock, right? such as low PE or low EV EBITDA. Uh, and it's not in contrast to growth investing, which is typically, um, oh sorry, the growth factor, which is typically high PE multiple stocks, such as Amazon or your Facebook, right? Um, you can actually have both value factor and growth factor in value investing because think about it, when you're buying a low PE multiple stock, you're actually buying something presumably for less than it's worth, right? When you're buying a high PE, growth investing stock, like an Amazon, you're buying it because you think it's less than it's worth, even though the PE multiple is high. So that is still value investing, 
right? The analogy is like when you buy a car, right? You buy it because it's less than it's the, the price you're paying is less than how much you can earn for you eventually, right? So um, let's say for traveling to work or whatnot. So uh, that's how I would describe value investing in a nutshell, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, right. I'll right. Stop right. Yeah. So so why are uh, you got your question, John? Yeah. Yeah. Because. Uh, it is a good point that Aaron brought up about um, value investing because currently there's so much marketing hype, Aaron, and I think you and I know this. Oh, I'm a dividend investor. I'm a growth investor, and all that kind of thing. What What would you say to to those kind of uh, different school of thoughts or even gap investing that kind of thing? How How would you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just to add on to that, also, it's it's actually like very linked to the question I want to ask is like why is it an issue? if value investing is just low PEs or value investing is just buying comp- companies with high returns on capital mm-hmm. or value investing is buying companies with a lot of free cash flow, which then may or may not translate into dividends, hence dividend investing. Yeah. Why is it uh, bad to, in a way, silo yourself into defining value investing in such a, I guess, in such a specific way? Correct. From your point of view. Yeah, sure. Sorry, John, can you repeat your question? So you... So there's a lot of uh, different school of thoughts on should I be a growth investor? Should I be? The labeling, lah, the labeling. And maybe just to link it to what MJ is asking is that is it good to, to silo and label yourself? Or is there no difference in your opinion? Or is it completely you know, uh, a <laughs> different way we should take a look at it? Correct. So the way I answer that question is through Charlie Munger's vote, uh, quote, which is that all intelligent investing is value investing, right? As long as you're buying something for less than you think it's worth, obviously, uh, whether you think it's uh, less than it's worth is subjective. But as long as it qualifies that with a sufficient margin of safety, it, it is qualified as value investing. So uh, I hope th- uh, I answer John's question satisfactorily. Yeah, because, because you see this... Um I think it's more, in my opinion, it's more for marketing hype, but I want to hear your opinion about why people want to put themselves into these kind of camps. You get what I mean? <laughs> to either to, to say wh- which method is more superior over the other. And as, as you rightly pointed out, Munger said that, you know, all kinds of uh, investing, as long as you're buying b- below, pri- uh, below the value, is actually value investing in itself. Uh, there's no distinction. Uh. Correct. So I'm, I'm not saying that there is no utility in uh, different labels <coughs> towards investing, right? Whether you're a dividend investor or a growth investor, uh, obviously people have different preferences towards risk reward and that has utility in the world. Having said that, uh, I don't think it's a sport, right? There's no, uh, there's no superiority involved for lack of a better word, right? As long as you're making money, a dollar is a dollar, right? It doesn't really matter <laughs> if I make a dollar because I buy a super low uh, a share price, I, I buy a super dying, sorry, a good company in a dying sector at a super low price or a very good company at, uh, at a very high price, right? Yeah. If you make the dollar, it's a dollar. <laughs> it still goes to your nest egg. Yeah, regardless of what you call it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, right. Sorry, MJ, uh, what was your question? Again? Yeah, so my question was uh, linked to that and that is, uh, what's, what, do you see a problem when value investing is defined as just low PE or buying high returns or high ROE <laughs> companies or like must have free cash flow uh, so can pay dividends? Because this I think is, uh, especially for people who just started, uh, even for people who have been in the industry for a while, that's how they understand it. And so they actively go out looking for these sort of stuff. Do you, what do you think of that kind of thinking? Sure. So yes, I definitely think there is a problem. And this concern is shared by the, the value investing community, the global value investing community. Uh, you, will, you will quite commonly see uh, a, a value investing celebrity mention that this is not value investing, right? So... <clears throat> The reason why this is a problem is because not just simply because uh, you are missing out on you know non low multiple opportunities. Uh, maybe I should just provide a bit of context, right? So what does uh, value investing according to Benjamin Graham, which is the low multiple earnings style objective, right? When you buy a stock for a low earnings multiple, uh, typically at a time we refer to them as net net stocks, which is you buy uh, 
a, a share for a price below its uh, working capital or fixed assets so that you can liquidate the assets right in the event you don't uh you are unable to uh to to sorry no you can liquidate the assets for for above what you paid it uh, paid for it um so that means that that's really more focused on the return side of things i think the beauty of benjamin graham's uh low multiple earnings uh sorry low earnings multiple style is that even if you are unable to liquidate the 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 working capital or fixed assets for whatever reason because you paid less than working capital for the shares in all likelihood you should be able to realize you know resell the shares at book value uh, above book value in the event of failure correct or at the very least above what you paid for it which means the priority is not really so much on returns the priority is about risk you really eliminate i mean if you are buying a stock for below working capital you pretty much have zero risk right <laughs> Your liquidation, your ability to resell the shares to another person, right, to another smart person, is nearly hundred percent. So if you actually look at Buffett's uh approach, which is not net net, he's buying good businesses, right? Uh, it's very easy to look back of hindsight and say that he he identifies compounders, but what he actually does is buy compounders during their bad times, right? And I think he also picked up something from Buffett in this sense that even though he's buying compounders and bad times the ones that he buys at the time they have very little risk for instance the seller oil scandal that most of you are aware of uh, it's true that the branding of american express was tarnished but the traveler's checks business was fine right so i i obviously the return i mean the primary objective is to uh, make money right when you invest in a in a stock but i think buffett really cared about risk as well right uh, it's something that he learned from Benjamin Graham in this sense. So low multiple star investing is, uh, according to Graham, it's not really so much about whether you're earning, uh, you're buying a stock because it's low and therefore it can go up, or whether you're buying it for dividends, or whether you're buying it for, um, I don't know what, for whatever reason. Uh, it's really about having low risk, right? And if you see... Uh, many value investors, they always prioritize this one thing, margin of safety. In fact, uh, Benjamin Graham has a quote, if challenge should distill the essence of value investing into three words, it will be margin of safety. And I think that's what he's trying to get at. Or at least right. that's my personal interpretation of it. So what is your personal interpretation then of risk? I think you used the word several times, so I just want to dig a little bit deeper into that because uh, risk is like, it's a very, very <laughs> complicated word, right? Like, to some people, risk is a mathematical equation. To some people, it's volatility. To some people, it's, it's you know, there are so many different ways to that risk, right? Like, uh, you know, the example is that uh, someone, two people in a room, you tell them, hey, you should buy bonds, right? One person say yes because it's low risk. The other one says no, it's high risk. So how, how do you understand risk? Sure. So, uh, if you actually understand Buffett's uh, this definition of it, it's the permanent loss of capital. Uh, and in during in my professional life, I obviously again because people have heard it so many times, it almost becomes cliche, right? So the way I reword it is, uh, we try and secure the protection of your client capital, correct? Because when you are managing your own money your first priority is typically returns. But when you're giving your money to other people to manage, your first priority is risk. Am I right? So, in order to truly appreciate what uh, risk means in this context, uh, I think I will seek a little bit into what value investing means to me. And then def after that, you will definitely be able to appreciate what I mean by it. So, value, in value investing to me can basically be brought down to two things, right? Um, the first is that... Uh, George Soros has a, has a quote. He says that it's not whether you're right or wrong uh, that's important. It's about, whether, uh, it's about what you make if you're right and what you make if you're wrong. I could be uh, paraphrasing. Basically, what it means is that um, when we look back and judge our performance, it's with the benefit of hindsight. But when we are making investment decisions for the future, you never will have the benefit of hindsight. Right? And unfortunately, uh, people will still judge you based, or you will still judge yourself based on what happens, what, what if, 
right? I had the benefit of hindsight when I could not possibly have had the benefit of hindsight. So in that sense, because you are unable to uh, see the future for the simple reason that it does not exist yet, right? You cannot approach it in terms of trying to uh, identify the future with superior analysis. Right? I feel that that is an imperfect approach, right? Rather, so this is what, uh, so, okay, sorry. So rather what you should do instead is approach it from a very risk reward basis. You can imagine uh, in the, we are in one universe today, right? And in the future, there are many multiverses, uh, right? To, to many different audience, potential, sure. outcome, potential outcomes, essentially, right? Correct. Yes, there are many possible outcomes. You have, uh, for me, what I would do is I would, an would uh, analyze the financial impact of all possible outcomes, right? So, uh, so because the definition of risk is one probability and two impact. So this is what I'm doing, right? I assign a probability to each financial outcome. So for instance, Air Asia today, it could go up, uh, COVID could recover, they could, you know, not do well, right? Yeah. They could just stay stagnant. Rather than trying to identify which one is going to happen, I prepare for every single outcome. So this is what uh, Soros means by, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. What right. matters is if you're right, what happens if you're right and what happens if you're wrong. Right. Okay. Because for the simple reason that you cannot know the future, and I believe uh some of you are maybe Game of Thrones fans, right? Uh, in one particular scene, uh, Littlefinger Peter Baelish, mm -hmm. he actually says something to Sansa. He says that uh, see everything in your mind, then nothing will surprise you. Something to that effect, correct? Yeah, yeah. So this is a very traditional warfare, uh, uh, strategy, right? And I think it also really really helps in investing. Right. Uh, the second thing that I would uh, uh, describe value investing as is to me is uh, under uh, Benjamin Graham's quote um, the what is the definition of investing the definition of an investment operation is w one which guarantees secures the safety of principle and adequate return right so you think about what that means right what does it mean? What uh, typical asset class has this characteristic of safety of principle and an adequate return? Right? FD it, or bonds. Uh. Correct. It's like a bond, isn't it? So what he is really looking for is a stock which behaves like a bond, right? But of course, necessarily there will be some higher risk involved uh, and higher returns. Right. But he is still prioritizing the safety of principle and note the words he used. He used adequate return. Yeah. All right. What? do most equity investors look for? It's a maximum, maximum return. returns. <laughs> right? Yeah. Maximum with returns and, you know, sometimes we don't even think about safety of principle, correct? When you talk yeah. about stocks, right? right? Yeah. right. So right. it's almost the flip side of things. So according to Graham's interpretation of uh, an investment, right, as opposed to a speculation, uh, you really need to prioritize safety of principle, right? So which means that Back to your question about risk, risk is really ensuring that you do not lose your capital, right? Managing right. the the permanence of capital, and I think the word the reason why we use the word permanent is to draw a distinction from temporary loss of capital, which is you know your paper losses that 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 occur from time to time, right? If it, if uh, uh theoretically it will go up, go back up, then that is not a permanent loss of capital. Right. So I, I like to take what you explain and I want to see how you uh how it's being put into practice in how you describe Air Asia later on. I think you brought Air Asia. So but before we segue into that, I think one of the challenges, right, for I mean apart from just grasping what you just said, is that even if someone does understand that there are multiple outcomes and then it's about uh an analysis of the impact and then uh you know uh, investing accordingly is that even if you do it right and then the outcome doesn't get in your favor psychology plays a role in that you know i did all this analysis i attributed all the probabilities i analyzed the impact yet it didn't come to it and so then there's a tendency for investors to then change the strategy this is a more psychological more practical side of things and i think it affects a lot of investors more than they like to admit so what is your um, 
approach to handling when to use a phrase that you use a lot, which is that you, you are not a winner and you don't get to write history. What is the response for you when, let's say you think Asia is potentially this and therefore risk reward is good, but then it turns out the complete opposite, you're wrong, you lose money. Yes, the risk reward might be great, but you know, only the risk happened, but not the reward. Yeah, so presumably you will actually have, uh, prior to investing in Air Asia, already have a very confident uh, assessment of uh, its valuation, right? Which means that uh, you have already considered the possible valuation of Air Asia in, let's say, 10 different scenarios, right? Uh, not including Black Swan events, because it's just not, uh, it's not feasible to prepare for all Black Swan events. So for any realistic uh, broad outcome, you should have already identified it and you already know how to react uh, in any particular, if any particular of those 10 uh, prepared scenarios have already, uh, do actually materialize. So George Soros actually is very famous for being able to cut loss very efficiently, right? The reason is because he has already prepared all the possible outcomes in his head, right? The moment something happens, he's just implementing, you know, backup plan code B or something, right? And if a black swan happens and it falls out of his, uh, his radar, then he will cut the loss immediately because he is not prepared for that. Mm. So you don't get into that situation where you feel that you lose control, right? Because typically what happens is you think it's going to go up and it goes down, right? And, and you lost the control and you panic, right? It's the, sen loss, it's the sense of loss of control that makes you panic and, and panic sell at the bottom. If you actually apply this framework the way that I do, in my own experience, I don't find myself surprised too often, right? When COVID happens, I mean, obviously I wasn't 100% invested in Air Asia at the time. So when COVID happens, you know, it's just another recession to me, right? It's not good for my portfolio, but not that I can control it anyway, right? I don't, right. so I don't really fall into that, that, uh, that scenario where I actually panic and then I, I just sell out of emotion, right? When things, uh, when a black swan event like COVID happens, I will just cut the loss if the new information tells me that I should cut the loss and I'm not prepared for it. I won't just hold out of uh, willpower. You do know what I mean? Something yeah. Like Sorry to interrupt this podcast. I know it's a little bit annoying, but I want to tell you something that I think can be really helpful to you. I can tell you're really interested in the stock market and want to learn more about it so that you actually know what you're doing especially when today things are getting more complex and complicated. That's why we came up with the Stock Investing Blueprint or SIB. It's our signature e-learning program that teaches you how to pick the right stocks most of the time, buy and sell it at the best possible time and manage your stock portfolio systematically. It currently has more than 10 hours of content and it's growing you also be part of a group of like-minded investors that can help speed up your learning process. To hop on the program, click on the link in the description or go to learn.viral.co slash courses slash SIB. Yeah, Aaron. Actually, good point. And I want to peel a little bit, another layer of that because you see, you mentioned George Soros and you gave examples of yourself, right? Now, what advice would you give uh, to the listeners especially? That multiverse of the optionalities or the events, how do you train uh, oneself to actually put a weightage on these events? So there's, let's just say there are 10 different outcomes and the probability risk reward for each outcome is different. How do you train yourself to put that weightage as well as that probability actually? Okay. So I will tell you my method, which I'm not sure is immediately practicable for uh, some people. <clears throat> the, the way is that you really just have to gain a very strong familiarity with the land, investing landscape right, with respect to that stock to the point where it becomes a gut feel. You just know a feel, get a very good sense that this is what the probability is around roughly. right? Like I think Munger said that very quickly, you don't need to know a person's weight to know that he's fat, right? So um, it's similar to that, right? Um, so if you don't, there's no uh, formula for it, right? That you can just reproduce like with an Excel spreadsheet. You really just need to understand it to the point of confidence, self-confidence, 
right? Like I mentioned just now. So when I say confidence, I don't mean that you show other people you're confident. What I mean is that when you sleep at night, <laughs> are you still confident about your valuation, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, if you, so, for instance, uh, you know, you you uh, for things we do in our daily life, we pretty much have a gut feel about the probability of a particular outcome, right? Like you you say something to this guy, what's the probability that he's gonna score you? Is there a formula for that? No, right? But to a nice guy, he may be twenty percent. To a not so nice guy, maybe eighty percent. It's just a gut feel, correct? So, and it doesn't yeah. need to be accurate at all. Actually, it's th- that's the that's the leading. I'm trying to lead towards that, lah. In a way, it's no precise science, but correct. at the same time, it's no. Even if you don't get it precisely correct, I think it's it's enough for you to get a framework or guidance on your probability outcomes weightage, lah. Yeah, correct. And I all would right. just uh, add very shortly that. At the end of the day, it boils down to margin of safety. Yeah. Right. You need to have a large, like say, fifty percent margin of safety before you put a lot of money into a particular stock. So it doesn't really matter if you're off by ten or twenty percent. You know. Yeah. So speaking of mm-hmm. gut feel, now, uh, what is your gut feel on Asia? <laughs> okay. Sure. So very interesting uh, stock. So uh, if you read my um, blogs, I actually am very bullish about uh. Sorry, I wouldn't say bullish, but I think they have a lot of potential, right? So obviously the the linchpin here is COVID because uh, COVID is pretty much something not under the control. And uh, based on my own estimates, which you can see on my blog, uh, assuming they get both the rights issue and the the Danana Jamin 1 billion ringgit loan, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think most people... Uh, do agree that they eventually will get. Uh, they should be able to last until mid next year, right? The cash runway. So, uh, if you want to go through it, uh, I'm fine. But uh, the the investment thesis really boils down to can they survive COVID or not? Because at this price, if they can survive COVID, it's an easy double. It's an easy double. Right? Wow! Wow! Okay. Yeah. So why is it? Why is it not just a double, but an easy double? Oh, it's because it's not just a double. It's a, it's probably a quadruple or five times, right? I'm talking about value investing, which is super long term. We're talking about ten years, mm-hmm. right? I'm not talking about next twelve months, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, because the upside is four times, five times, and it's an easy double, right? To answer your question, but yeah, let's just go into it. So, uh, please do uh check out my blog article about uh Air Asia, right? Uh, maybe you guys can link it in the description later. So um, I'm just going to switch my screen and take a look at it myself to recall. If you go all the way to the bottom, right, you can actually see that. Uh, okay, you can see there are a few PowerPoint slides uh, which explain the the bull, th- bull case thesis. So first of all, they are in a commoditized sector, which means that. The customer only cares about the price at the end of the day, right? Getting the lowest price. Uh, when you sit on the airline seat, don't tell me that you want to <laughs> pay extra for for what something that looks premium, right? You rather you would rather pay less and suffer a cramp seat, right? So, uh, because of that, um, all all pe- customers only care about price. The competitive bottleneck boils down to having the lowest cost, and Air Asia does have that among all the ASEAN airlines. Uh, in USD terms. I'm not sure whether today is still true with COVID, but pre-COVID, it definitely was true, okay? So what happens is that if you have the lowest cost, you typically become the market leader uh, over time. So you can see many examples of that in other commoditized industries, you know? Um, or even just airlines in other countries, right? Southwest uh, during the 80s, Ryanair, right? And uh, also, um, if you look at things like, you know, your typical retail shop, Right, like your Speedbuy ninety nine, your Tesco, they all, uh, they all deliver. They are a low cost leader model, right? And because they are the low cost leader, they become the biggest person, and they gain economies of scale. And you know, with economies of scale, you get to spread your fixed cost over a larger unit revenue base, and therefore you can get even lower costs. And it's just perpetuates. That's how the rich gets richer. Right. So, so, so before that, I just wanna double uh, because I think. For some of us, what you just said there about fixed costs, like what does that actually mean in the real life? Like spreading your fi- uh, fixed costs and then uh, and how does that 
relate to scale? Like how like for an airline, what does that actually look like physically? Okay. So I think it's not intuitive when you when we refer to spreading the fixed costs, right? Uh, rather it's just that you have more revenue out of it right? for instance let's say you buy a photostat machine right? or let's say in Asia you buy an airline uh, an airplane right? if you can jam pack more customers into the same plane compared to another guy who cannot right? a competitor who cannot then you are effectively spreading your depreciation right? every annual and your annual expense on the profit and loss account uh, over a larger revenue unit revenue base because your depreciation stays the same <clears throat> let's let's assume your your useful life of a plane is like what 15 20 years right so you have a fixed depreciation cost right which is the total cost of the airplane divided by 15 years right if you can earn more money on that you are effectively spending a fixed cost better right right okay so 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 continue with your uh, your, your your thesis on Asia sure so um uh, so so they have good economy of scale. The second is that they have a very good um, uh, TAM, total addressable market, because of the ASEAN growth story. So uh, as some of you may know, China's labor cost is increasing and it's reaching the point where the low value add items may not be, make sense to manufacture in China anymore right? as they graduate into a first world country. Um, so that manufacturing, global manufacturing base has to move. And where is it moving to? It's going to be ASEAN because compared to other similarly uh, developed regions like Latin America or arguably South Africa, right? Uh, the the polit- I mean, as bad as you think politics in Malaysia is, politics there is worse. Okay, it's less, much less stable, and yeah, I mean the, things are burning and the soot in the air essentially uh, right now in South Africa, right? Uh, yeah. In fact, in Cuba, the most recent news, they're having pro- huge protests right now. Um, and uh, yeah for instance like that and you know on the topic of failed states right you just look at Haiti and Venezuela they were where Malaysia was we were, we were the same place as them uh, in the 1950s during the post-war period and today we are so much better off so ASEAN really will grow <coughs> um, significantly because of that it, it's, it's not too inaccurate to say that we are where China was around 1990 when Deng Xiaoping took over right and instituted the feel the cross the river by feeling the stones policy. So we are around there and I'm not saying that it's hundred percent true that ASEAN will the ASEAN growth story will materialize, but it definitely has a good chance of it. And because of that, uh the population okay, our population is young, it's growing, and our discretionary income will because of that also grow. So you think about your typical person in Vietnam who earns, I don't know, the equivalent of uh, two or three thousand ringgit here, right? Uh, if they want to fly to Malaysia or Singapore for holiday, sorry, if they want to travel here, are they going to take a bus? Are they going to take a boat? No, they're going to take an LCC. So the LCC market, which is Air Asia's total addressable market, is going to just skyrocket over time. And if you're willing to go out even further than ten years, let's say thirty years, right? You will actually uh. So Asia actually has a very interesting phenomenon where uh, it's similar to the US in around 2016. If you recall, Warren Buffett actually bought the big four US airlines in 2016. Yep. Uh, why did he do that? Right After vowing never to touch them for like, maybe two times already since then, now it's the third time. So <laughs> it's the reason is because the big four US airlines at the time they had an oligopoly in terms of market share. Right, they own sixty six percent of the market. Uh, even today, it's still sixty five percent. Um, so because of that, uh, they can do an informal cartel, where they just meet you for coffee and say, hey, uh, let's just pay, fix the price at this price, right? Let's not compete with each other. Obviously, it's illegal, but that doesn't never stop anyone before, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when you do that, you have pricing power, and pricing power. Warren Buffett actually says it's the most important thing a business can have. Why? Because when you raise your prices and it doesn't affect your volume, you don't need to raise your costs. Right? It's free money and drops straight to the bottom line. So imagine you have a low margin business and you raise your 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 that is like single digit margins. If you raise your revenue by five percent, the whole thing drops to the bottom line and it's not affected by the net the historical net margin. 
right? You can just imagine the earnings growth power that, that is behind that. So uh, the reason why Warren Buffett sold is because when COVID came in, the, the oligopoly disease uh, fell apart because um, now you have all these PE firms bidding for bankrupt airline assets, right? So their cost base can now be much lower than what Warren Buffett assumed if there were no COVID. But 30 years time, when ASEAN becomes the next China, well, who's to say that the lowest cost uh, airline, right, the market, <coughs> the market leader in, in the region, cannot replicate this strategy, right? In all likelihood, what happens in a commoditized sector is that uh, because the, the competitive bottleneck boils down to economies of scale, you will just see them merge and merge and merge. And at the end of the day, there are just four or five of them controlling 80% of market share. Just think about our banks, right? Think about our insurance companies, uh, something like that. So yeah, eventually I think there is room for air issues to do that. I'm not saying it will happen. You should bank your investment thesis on that. But if that does happen, 10 times is really not unbelievable. I, yeah. can, I can promise you, yeah. Yeah. Actually, the I'm I'm very aligned with you on the Asian thesis and the um, growing labor market demand due to co- uh, cost increase in China. Where I just like to get your thoughts, uh, uh, especially for Asia and the aviation sector, is more about scalability, la. So, obviously, in terms of fleet size, uh, we all know Asia is uh, is right right up there, la. It's king, right? Um, how does this play into their favor as comparatively to the upstarts, guys like Viet uh, Vietjet, guys like uh, Scoot? You know, I think Scoot. Ha- I, I've not followed it uh, in detail, but I think it's not not seeing the success. Jetstar, uh, yeah, Jetstar, right. yeah, Firefly, yeah, right. yeah. You know, uh, I've always been amazed by how uh, scalable Asia is, and how do you think it will pay, play into their favor? That's that's the bull case, but also, what do you think would be the for the lack of a better word, the screw ups that Asia can <laughs> can do, <laughs> the risk, the, the risk. risk, yeah, <laughs> the risk that Asia that you know it's risk in somewhat. Uh, I, I'm trying to no narrow it down to what they can do themselves to uh, to to diminish their own uh, the uh, dominance. Uh, actually, okay, so um, I think I have a lot of respect for uh, Mr. Tony Fernandez and his management team. They clearly are. Uh, all inclusive thinkers so they do appreciate the management of risk right for instance you may ask yourself why are they going to Air Asia Digital today right with such a hugely profitable airline industry that is so capital intensive every dollar should be spent into the airline business I think the reason is because COVID which they cannot control is something that has a possible I mean the possi- there is a very low probability that uh, the airline business just stops becoming feasible due to COVID, right? If we have your gamma and beta and, you know, uh, variants, right? It could be a, a COVID ice age, as I like to call it. So they are very prescient in the sense that they are preparing for the worst case outcome, right? And I think that as far as managing risks from what they can control is concerned, uh, I'm not too worried about that. Um, is your question about in the context of fleet size, the economics of fleet size? Yeah, so the bull case would be the fleet size is uh, as what you mentioned earlier about consolidation. I, I see that as a big advantage for Asia. So that's that's the bull case. But the bear case in the sense that you see, when when I, I'm trying to link towards uh, Airbus and Boeing. If you right. look at the culture of Airbus and Boeing, uh, Boeing was so far ahead in terms of uh, their history, their dominance, and Airbus caught up because uh, they adapted a more aggressive stance on uh, uh, innovation, uh, uh, engineering, and all that. They took more, much more bold risks. So, you know, in, in the end, Boeing actually lost their, their lead somewhat, lah, right? And I'm trying to draw that parallel to Asia. They, they're so far ahead in terms of fleet size and all that. What, they can, what can Asia, what do you think Asia can do that can be detrimental to their lead? currently as as a bad case okay i would rephrase the question because i don't think air asia will deliberately make mistakes right or at least they i don't think the chance of that is very very high uh in terms of okay so just to uh, wrap up your other question in terms of fleet size i don't really think that fleet size is a operational risk 
because typically before you order your plane or in LH's case they lease their planes right you already have estimated demand and uh, the operational risk would be the demand don't materialize for an airline industry I don't think I mean short of black swans like COVID right I don't think that you really need to worry about that because your customers are so fragmented you are, they are literally families and individuals right? it's not one big customer who can just disappear one day so you don't really need to it's, it's basically like having a diversified portfolio you know what I mean so you don't really need to worry about demand dropping off short of a government instituted lockdown mm, right? mm. which is not really their fault at all um, and to be f- and and to 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 be fair, their competitors are also suffering the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's on the same what, boat. <laughs> yeah, a uh, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, dropping tide also makes all boats fall. Right. Yeah. So um, I think what you really to rephrase your question is more on what can their competitors do to eat yeah. into their market share, right? Yeah. Is that something more? Yeah, because you remember, uh, just to anchor on the earlier point about all the optionality and the risk reward, I'm trying to p- paint what would be the bad case scenario for Asia losing its dominance. So I gave probably one or two examples of their fleet size and their dominance. But what other things, and I, I think you rightly pointed out, is their dominance to lose? What, what are the scenarios that can happen for them to lose that dominance? To be quite frank, <clears throat> I don't think there's a lot because first of all, I believe in your management team, right? Um, they have been... So, for instance, you could overhedge on fuel, right? That's one good example. But uh, I think he has actually come out to say before that, uh, that they're not going to hedge fuel anymore, right? Uh, you could actually... Okay, so one thing I think could be a real operational risk is the fact that they are they are buying a lot of new planes and they keep updating the planes because they lease the planes, right? They can just give back the old plane and just get a new plane at a higher cost. When you do that, what you're doing is locking yourself into psychicality because uh, think about the economics of having a new plane versus an old plane. A new plane is more expensive upfront cost, but you use less fuel cost. So you have higher fixed costs and lower uh, variable costs, right? And that fixed cost comes comes due uh, whether rain or shine, whether during good times or bad times. So during good times, you will have high customer demand in more than offsets and you have low fuel costs, right? You tend to have very high margins. Uh, but during bad times, what happens is that, okay, let's say, let's flip, I- invert the, the, the picture. If you are low, if your airline owns uh, old planes like Delta Airlines in the US, until recently, uh, they, they are historically have been well known for owning uh, uh, very age, a very aged fleet of like 12 or 14 years old or beyond that. So, um, sorry, I think it's older than that. It's about 20 years old. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, it's about 20 years old. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very old. So when you do that, obviously your fuel cost will be higher, much higher, right? But you acquire it at a very low uh, upfront cost. And because of that, you have flexibility. When a recession comes, you, you just lower your fuel cost, right? In tandem. So you are not exposed to that high uh, debt or lease commitment that you made, right? To to acquire the airplane in the first place. So in Delta's case with old planes, you are uh, anti-cyclical, counter-cyclical. With a new plane, you are pro-cyclical. So for instance, now, right? If the lessors just said, hey, I don't want to give you the lease forbearance, you're in trouble, you know. You know what I mean. So, uh, that is an operational risk that I can see. Another one would probably be with the airports, right? Because as you know, an airport is a regulatory. Uh, at the end of the day, is a regulatory uh, exposure, right? And um, um, the LCC business model of having your airports in outskirt areas, right, is a bit uh, exposed to search vagaries, right? So as a result, for instance, if your airport operator doesn't want to build an airport in the outskirts for you, too bad, lah, right? And it's not just Malaysia, it could be Vietnam, it could be Thailand, right? That's why you see Tony Fernandez is always buddy-buddy with the politicians, right? In the whole of ASEAN. So it, China as well, right? Because China is expected to be a feeder route, route into ASEAN, right? Over the next decade. So, you know, if Xi Jinping doesn't like Tony Fernandez's face, 
the one to grant him a, a, a airport in Yunnan, right? <laughs> Access to the airport in Yunnan. Then too bad lah, you are not in LCC anymore, lah, right? <laughs> you gotta go to Beijing, ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and I, 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 you know, I had the privilege of talking to Tony and a few of his management team before. He, he did uh, mention that this is one of his biggest headaches. Uh. That's why he, he's frequently traveling around and virtually, for the lack of a better word, he's virtually asking for slots uh, on, 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 on these airports. And I think one advantage that I, I, I feel uh, is that most countries want an LCC industry to be developed in a way it's helping play to Tony's favor la. it says hey come come fly 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 into my city secondary or tertiary kind of city we'll build the airport for you we we'll make sure it's low cost and everything and so I, I feel that is in a way what uh, is an advantage to them as well correct and also just to add on to your point uh, the airline and en- airplane engines have developed to a point where you can cross make a cross continental point to point flight in the US right yeah so yes. Uh, that's about 7,000 km, right? The, the point to point in the furthest distance between Malaysia, in, within ASEAN, which is the northwestern point of Myanmar to the north, southeastern point of Indonesia, is only about 6,000 plus. Yes. Which means that in five years, LCCs can fulfill the role of an FSC yeah. as long as you want low cost, right? Correct. So, Correct. you know, if you are not rich, you don't really need an FSC anymore. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So actually, I want to steer the conversation a little bit different now, which is I think when I've been to a few uh, AGMs with uh, John to, you know, uh, in their old the Red Q right, their new office. So Tony is fond of saying that you know when he meets analysts, uh, he gets a little bit frustrated. I can sense uh, my gut feel that uh, people that he thinks. That he he doesn't want analysts. He doesn't like the analyst. Still, typifies him as Asia as an airline company, right? He is fond of saying, "Ah, uh, we are now a digital company. We have all these digital initiatives and all that." So, what are your thoughts on it? Because um, you know, if you read the recent uh, rights issue, uh, the document, he talks a lot about uh how the digital business is doing really well, right? Uh, teleport. And I can't remember the, the other one, huh? but basically the logistics plus, I think Big Pay, lah, that's the other one. They are, I think they're <clears throat> trying to get a license and all that. So is Asia more than just an airline to you? Um, okay, so I have my own theories about this, which may not be correct. Again, it's that multiverse outcome uh, uh, explanation. Um, I think the genesis for him becoming gung-ho about digital really uh, is because of COVID, right? So I would imagine when, when COVID happened and all their planes were grounded by the government, they, their board or rather their management team came together for a meeting and says, hey, what happened if this goes on forever, right? Like we can last one year, we can maybe last two years, we can't last forever, what happens then? The answer is that the airline industry will just collapse, right? Mm. And it's not just Asia, all airlines will collapse. And... um they need to hedge themselves, right? They need something else, whatever it may be. So what is that the most ideal something else could be? Uh, you know, it's very logical, it's digital, because why? First of all, uh, digital is being embraced by the widespread, widespread population. So digital adoption is going to come there, right? It's going to be more familiar for people like your mom or my mom to, or even our grandmas, right, to start using Shopee and Teleport, correct? So he already has Teleport, uh, being, Teleport is, was already being developed prior to COVID, right? And you know, in logistics, again, it's a commoditized industry. You can save a lot of costs and create a lot of economies of scale by shifting everything to digital, right? The way, the same way that you could have eliminated travel agents and get people to book online 20 years ago, right? So, um, um, <clears throat> in the sense, it's very wise, very prudent, and, and also very uh, precocious because uh, in the event that COVID, we recover from COVID and go back to normal, and there's no more, um, right? We, we don't need digital anymore. You can still use that assets in the teleport business. You can still use those assets in 
big pay, for instance, right? The, the, the things which is already endeavors, which is already pursuing prior to COVID. So you don't waste all those assets compared to if, let's say, you go and start, I don't know, <laughs> Santan, right? <laughs> you go and start a, a, a physical food F&B restaurant. How are you going to synergize that back into your airline business? No way, right? You can't, well, Santan on wheels, I don't, I don't see that happening. So anyway, um, it's very smart because he is also thinking in terms of multiple outcomes. And it's not just him. Every large cap CEO thinks that way. Right? So when I describe value investing, the, the, the framework, it's the same way as any businessman thinks, or at least any you know, businessman running a large company thinks. Um, what he does is that he says, hey, okay, this, this might happen, COVID might recover, but we also might be in a COVID ice age. If the COVID ice age happens, what are we going? What how are we going to respond? How should we respond to that in the best way? The best way is you respond to that with digital, and then if COVID does happen, we can just recycle the assets back into the airline and or into logistics, right? It's a win-win for everybody, including I mean for for themselves, right? So very very smart. Uh, this is the kind of things which make you you know respect them, right? <laughs> for that of a better word. So um. I, I do think that digital has legs, right? But I think it plays second fiddle to the airline. Okay. Oh, I think I think Tony will be half happy lah with what you say. You know? Yeah. So I, I hope he becomes my friend. Yeah. So I mean I I wanna move on to the next talk, but just just to end, like uh, give us your sense of the valuations for Asia. Correct. So the investment thesis of Air Asia is simply if they recover from COVID, they are easily going back to pre-COVID price. Call it two ringgit. Right? So the reason is because uh, if, if you are aware PE multiples, right, they represent the risk reward of the stock at any particular point in time. For instance, last year top glass PE was very, very high. This year it's not so much, right? Um, it's because the risk reward has changed. So when uh, when co- if COVID recovers, not only will Asia's earnings improve, obviously, right by the fact by virtue of the fact that their planes are actually flying, uh, their PE multiple will also improve, right? And there will be a small a section of people like me who uh, are prioritizing the far future as opposed to the next twelve months, who will also factor into part of the share price. So you know, call it I don't know twelve times PE, right? And then back to prehistoric earnings of 1.5 billion ringgit. So let me just calculate that for you, right? 1.2 times 12. That's about 14 billion market cap. What's the market cap now? 3 billion. Right? Yeah. So you dilute you dilute that by about call it, I don't know, even 50%, uh, 60%. Yeah. That's quite 70% just for fun, right? Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, we're four. Then it's still four billion. It's still it's still what double right now. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Oh, um, yeah. Not, not double, but you get a sense. It's almost. It's still break even. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I I've always had one question with relation to Asia's valuation, which is this, right? So, when I compare, let's say the US and ASEAN, right? Uh, you get a quad. I don't know. I don't even know if there's such a word like quadopoly with the four four of them, right? Oligopoly. Yeah, oligopoly. Yeah. So, with with Air Asia, it seems like they are ultra dominant, and maybe you could argue there's a duopoly with, I guess, uh, Lion, uh, Malindo, maybe. But certainly they are the dominant player. And so, what's interesting to me is that when I look at Southwest, and this is like, I think 2017, 2018, when, you know, people like Monish, uh, Monish Babra, and Buffett, they are really into airlines. Um, what I noticed was that Southwest, for example, which is probably the best among the four, uh, was trading at like 16 to 18 times earnings. But then Air Asia, and this is pre-COVID, right? With what, 10 billion in sales, 12 billion in sales, something like 20s or, or at least slightly under 20% net margins, trading at six, seven times earnings when they are at I, I've always wanted to get someone's opinion on why that is the case. Because for me, I mean, logically, like, if one out of the four olig- oligarchs in the US would get 18 times earnings, it follows that 
you know, something like Azure should be like 30 or 40, God forbid, right? I mean, that's a bit extreme, lah, but I mean, just logically. Sure. So like I said just now, the PE multiple is dependent on the risk reward at any particular point in time. And the risk reward for ASEAN is understandably much higher than, I mean, much lower than uh, in the US, right? So in the US, if you are an organ work properly, uh, you pretty much, your earnings are pretty much guaranteed, uh, short of black swan events like COVID. Whereas in ASEAN, uh, you know, Lady, Lady Fate hasn't dealt her cards yet, right? Something could happen. I don't know. Anything could happen in 30 years, right? So when you're talking about super far out there and also keeping in mind that a large bulk of Asia's investors are, you know, more focused on the next 12 months. So um, I think there are a lot of reasons to answer your question, right? Which actually uh, would more than, more than accommodate, right? Why it's trading at such a discount to Southwest Airlines. Just a fun fact for you guys, uh. Vietjet is uh, trading at a P trailing P multiple of uh, forty nine times. Uh. <laughs> we that's least, today, right? Yeah, that's today. That's today. At least they have earnings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most surprising no, meeting to me that they have a P. You know. <laughs> no, the thing is two two four. One is that Vietnam is actually open right right now yeah. amidst COVID, and yeah. they can actually fly Vietjet. Right. right. Through, yeah. through Vietnam yeah. and second of all is the Vietnam growth story so the ASEAN growth story is basically the Vietnam growth story today yeah. right so again that has already materialized the risk is lower right. for Malaysia not so much yet although right. there's a good chance but the multiverse can just decide to sneeze a different direction correct yeah, yeah. so okay I, I look as, as always at, with Asia there's always more to talk about but uh, let's uh, take a break right and let's go to Bajaya Corp, right? So recently they've had huge shakeups. There is, uh, to my knowledge, even public contradictions between the board and uh, Jalil, who's the guy who has just came in. Um, you know, he's very active on Twitter. He outlined his strategic vision. He has uh, said things like, you know, target price. I, I don't know, at least the interpretation that target price is 10 ringgit. He, he actually said uh, closer to 10 than 5. So it's a minimum right. of seven fifty. <laughs> okay la. So I'll take it as five point one. So, uh, so it's a very complicated thing, and a lot of people actually ask us, uh, what do we think, and we we have no thoughts. And I know that you spend quite a lot of time. I'm not sure you do have a blog post on this. Uh, but not, no or not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. So, give us a sneak peek of that blog post. I guess you know what is going on at Bajaya. I know that you do see a similar kind of risk reward situation with Bajaya and Asia. So yeah, give us your thoughts. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm going to surprise everyone here by saying that I believe about Jalil when he says that it can go up 30 times, right? From today's price. So it's 25 cent today. Uh, I believe it can go up to his stated, minimum stated 750 target, right? And when I say uh, it can, uh, keep in mind what I mean is that that's the intrinsic value. I'm not saying it will happen in the next 12 months. Right? So if you if you <laughs> expect it to go up in the next 12 months, I'm sorry. La, right? It's not going to happen. <laughs> so um, here's the thing, right? Uh, Bajaya Corp actually has a lot of very interesting assets in their uh, stable of businesses. So for instance, uh, I'm sure you are aware they have two listed companies, which is, um, what do you call it? Uh, Starbucks as well as 7-Eleven, right? And uh, also he has a lot of land, right? These are all public information. Uh, you can go into their, their annual report and check the back of the annual report. All the land assets are there. So what you can do is just see the hectare, right? The acreage and then find out the rough market price on a website that bricks or something of the area and then just multiply it, right? And then you plot it all on the spreadsheet. I haven't done it yet. But, you know, I imagine it's well above 1.5 billion ringgit fair value. Yeah. So, the, well, the, sorry, 1.25 billion. The reason why I bring up 1.25 billion is because that's the cost of the land on the books. So right? it should be, in theory, it should be higher than that because like, it has not been revalued for quite a while, right? Yes. So typically what happens is that uh, people tend to hold land on their books right, at cost. And then only when you want to do something with it, then you revalue it to fair value. So because they have not done anything with it for the past 20, 30 years, right? 
there's no legal requirement for them to do that. So, uh, I mean, we don't even need to go to. So, so I think um, what he, what he, I, I would clo- very reasonably estimate that that land is worth at least three times, you know, its, ca- its book value, its cost value, because it's been 20, 30 years, right? And you know, the past 20, 30 years, yeah, has been pretty decent for land. Uh. So, um, that's quite 5 billion to be safe, right? That's really well above the market cap. Uh, but I don't really think that so, okay, before I get into the crown jewel, let me just touch on some of the things he said in his blog article, right, about his transformation. So he actually um, did mention a few things. First of all, he said that we're going to do a digital strategy, right? So the digital strategy is really about streamlining things, about looking for synergies in areas where they may not have. Right? As most of you are aware of, the way Bajaya used to be run is that uh, the management used to, to empower their subsidiary uh, operate, operating managements, right? So they basically kind of leave them alone. Um, whereas right now, they're going to stream that, they're going to cut the fat, right? And if you got redundant assets, uh, remove it, and then see where you can synergize, cross synergies, right? Especially in the digital era, uh, which the, the COVID has accelerated. So uh, basically, rather than being run like a small business, which is leave your guys alone, uh, they're going to start running it like a normal conglomerate, right? So that's really the thesis. The, the investment thesis that I have is basically assume that after they have cleaned up all the fat, they have streamlined things, they have found their synergies, right? They can identify in which particular 7-Eleven, uh, what, what, how many bananas were sold at which particular point in time, right? Which is what any... <laughs> any retail store right now can do, um, they they will be, should be able to achieve at least 5% ROE. Okay, so 5% ROE on an equity base today is about 9 billion. Let's just call it 10 billion for simplicity, right? Uh, that's 500 million ringgit. Okay, the market cap now is 1.5 billion. So you're talking about a three times five year forward, 2026 forward PE. So I don't know about you, but a company like Bajaya Corp, which has at least 5% earnings growth and can virtually never go bankrupt by virtue of the fact that it's a conglomerate, right? It has been loss making for the past roughly 10 years and it hasn't gone bankrupt yet. Um, uh, 3 times PE is, to me, is just a bit silly. Uh, right? Like I would easily pay 6 times PE for this. Uh. So what do you think of the, there's always this conglomerate discount, right? Like you see, like a lot of people will actually do this sum of parts analysis on the conglomerates. Hey, you know, this, this, that, you know, let's say in Vijaya's case, hey, they are Starbucks franchise and all these things, right, are worth more just by if you separate them out. And well, what, what do you think of that? Because it <laughs> seems like the this this discount is quite permanent in the eyes of at least many investors. Huh? So the, 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 the reason why conglomerates usually have a conglomerate discount is because it's difficult to analyze them, right? They're very complex. People just tend not want to touch them, right? Like you think about analyzing something at like Sunway, you got thin mining, you got construction, you got property, right? By the time you analyze all five or six sub, sub, sub uh, business segments, you really could have analyzed six different sectors already, right? So there is that friction over there. Whereas with Bajaya Corp, that's not the case because 60% of their current revenue is based on retail. Right, it's a consumer sector. The other thirty percent is property, right? And the other ten percent is the true conglomerates. So um, it's pretty much just two sectors, right? I don't think that in five years, when Jaliu has stated he wants to streamline and make it extremely transparent, right, and visible for all. In fact, he has already done that in the recent Bursa interview he had, right? I think about a week ago. Um, yeah, uh, it's basically just two sectors. So I don't think that you will suffer from a conglomerate discount. right? The reason why Bajaya Corp used to trade at discounts is not because of a conglomerate discount. right? It's for many other reasons. What do you think of uh, a strategy where, you know what Saim Darby did with their plantation and their, you know, to give an example of a conglomerate, to split them up and to separately list Spin-off, them. Do you think, uh, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Do you think that is a viable option for Bajaya? No, so if you actually look into Bajaya Cop's history, right, 
I mean, I'm I'm probably simplifying, oversimplifying, but the way they used to run Bajaya Corp is basically like a VC fund, right? You bring in foreign brands, you incubate like DG or Starbucks or 7-Eleven, you incubate them, and then the successful ones you list. So why is it they have always been unpro- perpetually unprofitable? Because when you list them, right? So you spend all that cost and risk to incubate the guy, right? The business. And then when you list them, you just gain a one-time fair value gain, right? And then and then all the other returns, right? Although it's the same shareholder benefiting from it, the Bajaya Corp entity does not benefit from it. And you know the way compounding works, you earn a lot more money at the end than the beginning, right? So like when you just become, start to become sustainable, then you go and list them off already, right? Yeah. yeah. So they have already been doing this forever. And um, I imagine your question is more on the BTOTO side, right? Because that's, uh, ironically, not just the BTOTO side. I, obviously, the BTOTO side he's planning to spin off. But I was, I, I was in a way a beneficiary of this spin off in, in a way before. Uh, he listed Bajaya Retail first time. Uh, he's listed, if, uh, I remember this very clearly because it was the f- one of the first times I kind of practiced value investing. Kind of. So I bought it at about 53 cents, went down to 40 cents. My <laughs> friends all sold, they lost money. Went down to 38, I bought some more. But then after after not not more than a year, he actually privatized it. So that, that, that that's where it boils down to my question. You know, you say uh, they incubate it, they make it uh, you know, fat nice, and then they sell it off. Alright, or li- spin it off. And then all of a sudden they say, Hey, you guys not valuing my company uh, well enough. Then you privatize again. <laughs> then <laughs> you see, so I don't know how I don't even know what they call it. I don't even think it's a flywheel effect. It's more like a recycle. This story recycles yeah, yeah. over and over and over again. So maybe just uh, just your thoughts on, you know, if that is still a feasible uh, cards to lay on the table, uh, I would say that. Sure. So just to defend uh, Tan Sri Vincent Tan a bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, people like, in, like people here, because of our Asian culture, right? Um, we tend to be more, how would I say? Um, pleasing to each other. Uh this kind of thing, uh, activity can be viewed as cutthroat, where 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 you prioritize things at the end of your at the expense of your minority shareholders, but they do this in the U.S. all the time, right? Activist shareholders they just privatize and, and lease and privatize. So I don't think he is doing anything worse than the guys in the U.S., right? It's just that because of our specific culture, uh, it gets that that how would I say that um bad vibes up. The, the confusion yeah. it's like Correct. short selling yeah. right? Yeah. it's like short selling like, yeah. like it, people don't really like short selling in this part of the world yeah. Correct, Correct. and also you got to remember that he's not doing it deliberately right because he didn't He in all likelihood he didn't know that three years after he, he leased he would pick it back up I mean the, the price would fall to a point where it's attractive enough to actually acquire the whole company back right so um I'm not saying that that is not a risk, but with Jalil at the helm, I think it'll be less about sentiment. It'll be more about economics, right? A very rational decision. And if you actually listen to all of Jalil's interviews, his YouTube, his uh, LinkedIn, as well as his podcast with BFM, right? You will get the sense that he's a very shrewd capital allocator, right? He's in a sense a bit like a Warren Buffett. Right, where he's not really getting his hands dirty in operations, but he's thinking about where's the best place to spend the next dollar, right? Put the next dollar to 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 earn a higher highest yield. Hmm. Um, I don't think he will do that unless it makes sense for shareholders. And also keeping in mind that he's a three point six percent shareholder. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Skin in the game. It's a it, it's a tail <laughs> risk. It's definitely a tail risk, but it's just a tail risk. So yeah. Oof. I think that sometimes uh, investors or just Asians alike tend to want to copy paste right from the West. And what do you think is the likelihood that you know Bajaya Corp can be become a a mini Berkshire? Uh, and what do you think the challenges are? Yeah, sure. So I had another question: How are they going to achieve their seven fifty target price? Right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Actually, yeah. that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. In his um in his, the recent MIDF interview, he was actually asked this question, right? And he responded by saying that he's going to be developing the land, right? Because he has some really 
prime areas acquired at super low cost. And as you know, in property development, your your it's basically boils down to what cost you acquire your land, your price you acquire your land at, right? So you you skim that huge margin. So imagine you 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 build a condominium on a you turn Bukit Kiara at Christian Park into a premium condo area, the rivaling the Jalan Yutan uh real estate development area. Uh you know, I could you could easily sell a call it two thousand five square foot condo for a unit, right? Condo unit for about call it two point five million. Right? Multiply that by the acreage of Bukit Kiara Christian Park, right? And the plot ratio of let's say three. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but having said that, having said that, I have, that's not my surprise. Uh, I don't think that's really true, okay? Because as much as attractive as such a property development strategy is, right? Like you can probably triple or quadruple your current valuation. You can't 30 times it, right? With that kind of fixed, fixed, uh, how do I say? Fixed revenue cost, fixed margin. Yeah. Uh, right. And also, usually it tends to be low margin, right? Uh, and very long gestation period kind of business model. So he has actually uh been very public about saying that he wants to do a retail strategy. Now, how can they actually achieve a thirty times increase from the current share price? Keeping in mind that thirty times is objectively ridiculous, right? Anybody tells you that, also you were wondering, huh? What? What? Right? <laughs> so. Uh, if I told you that also, I can 30 times my portfolio, right? you also be writing me off, right? <laughs> so here's how I think you can do it. Um, the crown jewel of Virginia Corp really is 7-Eleven's middle mile logistics channel. Because given COVID has accelerated the the adoption of digital, uh, digital adoption by the white population, right? Um, we are all familiar with Shopee and buying things through e-commerce compared to offline retail. So there's no more that that how to say uh, that le- that hump you gotta get across for the older generation to learn about e to use e-commerce. In um in e-commerce, you have no rental costs, but you have high delivery costs, high delivery fees, right? So that's the trade-off you're gonna make when you are switching from a offline retail model to an e-commerce model. Uh, so if you actually observe what happens in most e-commerce giants, right? The likes of um, JD or what do you call it, um, Amazon in, in the US, what they do is that they eventually in house their logistics channel, right? So I actually have a good article on this on my blog, right, about Amazon. Um, what the early Amazon so early, early Amazon investors saw, right? You can go check it out. Basically, the thesis is that Amazon from day one never considered eBay its competition. It considered a Walmart is competition, right? Because uh, it wanted to take over the whole US as it has done today. And how has it done that? Um, as I told you, in a commoditized business, the competitive bottleneck boils down to economies of scale. So uh, what has Walmart in terms of logistics that uh, you know some like a small guy like me who wants to do an e-commerce operation does not have in terms of logistics? They have something called a hub and spoke distribution logistics model. So what happens is that rather than being point to point where I, you know, order a post Malaysia a grab a grab driver to come and send my give my package to somebody else, right? You imagine you do that a million times, right? It's very expensive. Um, what Walmart does is that they have a huge twenty ton equivalent unit trailer, right? Your big your big trailers, right? The container truck, deliver to a regional warehouse. Right, and then that regional warehouse they will split up into uh, many smaller trucks to local warehouses, which then, so this part is called the middle mile, right? And then from that local warehouse they will deliver to the actual address of the buyer, which is called the last mile. So, um, uh, why is the hub and smoke distribution model, that's uh, sorry, logistics model, so efficient? Because First of all, you have economies of scale. You are loading up a full truck. And if let's say in your local warehouses, your small trucks, one guy has too much inventory and one guy has not enough inventory, you can just put it all into one truck and not use the second truck, right? So you save a lot of costs and you can reduce your operational risk by uh, having a fixed schedule, by planning for tra- high traffic uh, 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 
hours, right, periods. So you reduce your operational risk, you reduce mistakes, you reduce the cost of doing business, right? And as I mentioned just now, the competitive bottleneck in e-commerce is your logistics channel because you have no rental and you have a lot of high delivery fees. So if you notice, right, Shopee has actually been doing a lot of promotions on shipping fees, right? It's not, why is that? Because, I mean, there are many reasons for that, but particularly because uh, that's the pain point for e-commerce customers to adopt uh, uh, e-commerce as opposed to going to a store, right? So, um, Bajaya Corp actually has this advantage in 7-Eleven. So, 7-Eleven, they control about 43% of it between Bajaya Corp as well as Tan Sri Vincent Tan. And you can imagine he probably has some friends who can bring that up to 50%, right? So, um, like, I was very surprised to find that Tan Sri... Uh, Lim, Wee, Lim Wee Chai is it? Uh, the Top Glove yep, founder. Yep. Yeah, he actually owns something like five percent of Seven Eleven. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, what was I going? Yeah. So, they could actually. So Seven Eleven actually has a very funny, right? <laughs> very funny um uh, uh model because they have two thousand four hundred stores around the country. Okay, 2004, or is it 2600? I don't remember. It's some insane number. That's 72 stores per million population in Malaysia. Okay, I think the average is like half of that. <laughs> I, I mean, don't talk about places like, you know, Thailand or, or, or Japan, where you have literally two stores facing each other across the street. Yeah. But in the majority of the world, it's half of that. So 72 is a lot, right? And what they can do is turn that, so they, they turn that into a mini warehouse because they make a daily round trip in the morning to every single one of those 7-Eleven stores, right? As far as the logistics channel is concerned, if you wanted to overlay an e-commerce strategy on top of uh, the rest of BJ Corp stable or foreign brands, all you need to do is just put another truck following the 7-Eleven truck behind it, right? You can even literally use the same model of truck, same mechanic, right? <laughs> and there's zero execution risk because you're just adding another truck. I mean, not zero, it's 0.01%. Uh. So, um, if that's the case, right, they have solved the middle mile, which is uh, half of the cost, right? So obviously the last mile would, be, would, would still be relying on 3PL players. But because they have um, <laughs> 2,400 stores in the country, right, they, they, their typical radius from, uh, from a potential customer is probably something like 10km, right? So the, the, you could just order, literally order the last move to send it from yeah, the 7-Eleven store to yeah, right. yeah <laughs> right so your cost is also very going to be very low in the last mile and it's not to say that they can just sit on their uh, what was it what is the term sit on their, their laurels sit yeah sit on, on their, on their laurels. laurels yeah they can also develop their last mile over the next five years which they will not have an advantage over the likes of Shopee or Lazada right but they their middle as far as their middle mile is concerned they have already leapfrog both Shopee and Lazada they have already in-house the distribution channel, turn the variable cost into a fixed cost, uh, and mix it turn it into operating leverage, right? Which means that keeping in mind also, this is all some costs. Okay. Mm. So they actually do have a logistics business called Secure Express, right? What they could do is privatize 7 Eleven, um, put all the assets under Secure, Secure Express. That's it, you know, it's as simple as that. Uh, your trucks, your warehouse, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh. So, um, and as he has mentioned many, many times in public, his strategy is going to be focused on consumer, right? Mm, yeah. Like I imagine property, uh, while it's operationally complicated, the the financial model is not very, the business model is not very complicated, right? Mm. You can pretty much just ask one underling to go and do it. So, his my assumption is that his focus will be purely on consumer and by extension because of his huge advantage in terms of logistics it will be an e-commerce strategy mm. right and that i can see becoming a 750 target price mm. right because mm. you just think about what i'm saying uh, the potential for him to make a shopee competitor is real you know right i mean i'm not even going so far right my investment thesis is really just that five percent roe or 10 billion and three times 2026 for B. That is my my personal investment thesis for buying the stock. But mm -hmm. you want to talk about blue sky scenario, right? 
first of all, he has so many retail brands in foreign retail brands. Mm -hmm. He can go out and acquire more, right? And Sri Vincent Tan is very well connected. Yeah. And then just do an e-commerce strategy in Malaysia. That is the low hanging fruit, the lowest hanging fruit. The high hanging fruit would be to start a competitor to Shopee. Do you know how profitable that could be in it? Yeah, yeah. He basically already has the middle mile of Amazon Prime sunk cost already. You know, right? Yeah. Just think about how long it will take Shopee or Shopee, right? To, to develop that in Malaysia. Minimum of three years. Yeah. And actually yeah. that's why Amazon when they wanted to go into the fresh food and all that, right? First first thing they did was acquire Whole Foods. Because yeah. Whole Foods didn't didn't just give them the uh, uh, retail arm, but also the logistical, the logistical infrastructure necessary to actually deliver fresh food and all yeah. that. Because it, that that is actually much more difficult than developing an e-commerce structure. Actually, it, whatever what you were saying just now, Aaron was uh, very in line to what if you tr- if everyone has traveled to Japan or Taiwan and everything, right? Their Seven Eleven is like their everything, you know. I I, yeah. I it's it's such an important culture. <laughs> To the Taiwanese, to the Japanese, or to even to the Koreans of their convenience store, because that's where they do their post, that's where they withdraw money, that's where they get their uh, uh, convenience and groceries and all that. And I, but here comes the uh, the other side uh, uh, of my thoughts uh, is that while it's very predominant for urban areas, uh, Aaron, it still doesn't solve uh, what uh, what I call the less urban, less dense kind of um, areas. How? Where do you do you think it is something that Bajaya should even embark on because it's not really that profitable, but also do you think that is probably an, an area where it can it can potentially bring them returns because there's no one else doing it is it because everybody thinks it's unprofitable they don't have skill what what do you think? So here's the beauty about it, Seven uh, Eleven is well known for having also saturated the rural areas, right? They have two thousand four hundred stores two thousand four hundred. Let me repeat that. <laughs> right? That's a huge number. It's not. Uh, I, I'm not saying that their density uh, of 7-Eleven stores in the rural areas is anywhere close to the urban areas. But if you're talking about, call it, I don't know, 30 km, right? You take any random spot in Malaysia, right? And then you you say, okay, I call it 50 km to be safe, like, right? Yeah. Uh, radius to the nearest 7-Eleven store. Yeah, you'll find one. Right, <laughs> so the 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 so uh, a few years ago, there's this company called My News, right? Mm. A li- which listed, and one of their thesis when they listed, right? Not now when their CEO just came in, uh, was that they could basically replicate a Seven Eleven industry, because while My News was relatively saturated in urban areas, they had basically no coverage in the rural areas, so they could just put a store n- next to Seven Eleven. And eat their market share, right? And Seven Eleven can't do anything about it because they're already there, right? <laughs> so all, all yeah. the market testing is all done already. You just copy, copy and replicate yeah. all the. <laughs> no, you just get a guy, right? Employee, you're gonna sit and you're gonna count the foot traffic for one month, yeah. right? Uh, and then you determine where's the best place to put your my new store first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Um, all right. yeah, yeah. So you got a question? Go no, on, no, go no, on. no. Uh, MG, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, look, I think there's even more to talk about Bajaya Corp. And I, I think that, that e-commerce strategy was very interesting. I think that was my thesis for QL as well, when they had a family mart. So um, now moving on to the last bit, uh, is, which is, uh, let's talk about macro, right? I think we've talked a lot about micro and um, start, like, it, it, what I realize is I always like to switch when it comes to chatting with investors because when you talk about micro, it's very specific. It's uh, that there's a famous saying by uh, Nassim Taleb, right? You cannot, you can macro bullshit, but you cannot micro bullshit, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. You know, if you think it's profitable, if you say that the margins is as such, you know, it's very easy to verify. So, uh, so let's micro bullshit for a bit right now so that uh, it's, it's a lot more intense when it comes to micro, right? Uh, yeah, macro. So um, I'll ask you about Malaysia right at the end, but what are your, what are the, some of the big trends you're seeing now in the macro, right? I, I don't want to give us a specific question. I just want to let, you know, just let me know what, what are they. Sure. Okay, so let me just list them down. Uh, pandemic, <clears throat> inflation, uh, fiat currency, or, or rather CBDC, digital currency, 
um, interest rates. Um, let me see. Um, debt to GDP, right? So high debt to GDP specifically. Uh, China. U.S. China tensions, right? Um, let me see. Um, okay, how about this big three, right? Or maybe I'll, I'll I'll pick for for you, right? Uh, okay. Let's start with um, some of the the stimulus that has been happening. Um, talked about just overall liquidity, right? From the perspective of interest rates stimulus and i believe china slashed their reserve requirement ratios uh recently so yeah just give me a sense of what do you think how do you think this will impact sure so actually the rrr i think is a bit too complicated for sure. many people to understand right but <clears throat> basic the basic idea is that i mean i'm sure all of you are familiar with the china growth story right it's going to become world number one soon so I'm not going to touch on the bull case. I think what will really add value to your listeners is touching on the bear case, right? Because they are they may not be so familiar with that. Uh, just to just to clarify, I'm not I'm I'm neutral on China. I I don't hate China. I don't love China. I'm totally neutral. But objectively speaking, the facts, right? Uh, I think they are the risks are, are extended. So for instance, if you take a look at their uh foreign exchange reserves, right? It's currently something like three point two or three point four trillion US. Three point two, yeah, 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 three point two. So their their economy is, I think, already exceeded fourteen trillion, right? USD. Yeah. So three point two trillion for fourteen trillion, uh, GDP, which is annual GDP, uh, not a uh, a uh, balance sheet account a number. Uh, um, that's exceedingly low for an open economy. Right, the likes of the US. Imagine if, uh, oh, or the likes of Malaysia. Right, imagine if we only had one quarter of our GDP in reserves. When there's portfolio capital, our currency is gone already. You know what I mean? Ours is about one third, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, one third. Yeah. Like I mean, I would like to see at least half, right? Half is like already super low. You want me to, like okay? For instance, Japan, right? They are. They are. Let me see. Uh. Yeah, I think they have four trillion, three trillion reserves, and then their economy is about four, maybe touching five, something like that. Yeah, something like that. So people like to say that. Okay, China right actually has a lot of similarities with Japan, before the lost decades. In the eighties, okay, you're talking about late eighties or eighties. Correct. So it has high about nineteen eighty, yeah, late eighties. Uh. um, it has very high systemic debt, right, which is. Household plus corporate plus um, government. Yeah. So many people think that, oh, China's system, a government debt to GDP is only about 50% prior to COVID. Today is 80%, but today is a bit special. Yeah. So 50% is really not high at all for a company that likes, uh, a country that likes of China. Most developing nations are close to exceed, far exceed 80%. It's like 88, 90. Really, yeah, right? the US is at 110, 120, something like that. Today, but prior to COVID, it was about 85. I right. don't know, something like that, right? And it, like the Eurozone, I mean, the PICS nations are well, almost close to 200 already prior to COVID, yeah. right? Japan is 300, uh, 270. Yeah. So people always look at the 50% and think, wow, this is good. But you have to remember something that um, China is a communist nation, right? And they have a uh, CCP puppet in every boardroom. So, yeah, sorry, that's my daughter. So they they can actually if okay the natural career progression for a uh, for a politician sorry for a CEO is CCP politician right in China, so if your future boss tells you to stimulate the economy on our behalf right for the national strategic interest, and you don't and you tell your future boss no guess what you won't get your future job lah, right <laughs> he's no more your future boss lah. so. Because of the nature of the communist, uh, the communist involvement in corporates, you really have to look at corporate debt to GDP to get a sense of the true stimulus in China. And if you combine corporate debt to GDP uh, with um, government debt to GDP, it's close to 300%. Right? Which is US at, levels, at, right? I believe. It's exceeding US levels. So US is 
Yeah, I think it's about the same. Right? The US is like 250, if I'm not wrong, right? Okay. So, yeah. So, um, uh, it's not very good, right? And uh, it's pretty much similar. And, and it's the same for the US as well. It's pretty much similar to what the Japan uh, was like in the 80s, right? They had extended uh, leverage and they had uh, inability to manage monetary policy well. So I won't bore your listeners with the intricacies of central banking. But basically right now, because of zero interest rates, they don't have a lot of room to maneuver in terms of monetary policy, which is why everyone is trying to go to negative interest rates, right? Mm. Uh, with CBDC. So, um, um, and also you are starting to see cracks appearing in the economy. For instance, there was backing, mm. right? Backing led, I mean, soon after backing, we had Huarong. And soon after Huarong, we had Evergrande. Right? And after Ever- soon after Evergrande, we don't know who it's going to be. We so don't, for, we- for, sorry, for the context of, because uh, I'm not even sure of these stories as well. So maybe you can share with us, like, if, like what, what do you mean when you throw those uh, names out just now? Sure. So they are all over-leveled companies which are having liquidity issues. Okay. So um, for instance, Evergrande. Evergrande is the biggest uh, property developer in, in China. And as you know, in China, the typical route to wealth, path to wealth for a middle class person is through property, right? Correct. So they have been overbuilding, and right now, uh, they have about, um, they have about two hundred billion USD of, uh, was it two hundred billion? Wait, let, let me think. Uh. they have some obscene amount of, I think it's fifty billion US. Yeah, correct. Fifty billion USD of debt to refinance next year. Wow. Right, within the next 12 months 7 billion of them has already said they are not going to refinance okay and do these guys are USD right I mean these guys tend to be foreign investors right because uh, in China it's a bit like the Kiritsu system in Japan where we help each other out in the, within the country right but uh, China if these guys are foreign investors let's say your Aberdeen or your I don't know your uh, Black Rock Amundi, Black Rock, Black right? Rock yeah. and they're not going to refinance you got to fill that hole somehow right and we're talking about next year you know we're not talking about you know, five years from the, the, now <laughs> yeah it's not the total debt stock you know it's a refinance next year kind of thing it's very similar to Serba today right yeah so um, uh, as a result uh, because and also because of how intertwined their businesses are across different industries and even with the government by virtue of the communist nature of the economy uh, when one guy falls it's a domino right so this was what right. uh, the US was worried about in the GFC which is why they stepped in uh, with China we can already see them stepping in so for instance uh, what happened is that they allowed insurance companies to issue perpet- no they allowed yeah insurance companies to issue perpetual bonds to the banks right so which means that they transfer money to the banks hmm. right then they allow the banks to consider that uh, perpetual bond perpetual means it's basically equity right yeah, yeah. as as a collateral for a repo repo is an overnight loan with wow. the PBOC right and also so basically you are transferring wealth from one sector to, to the rest of the economy and also they have um, so uh, they have also instituted uh, interest rate caps or, or rather interest rate interest rates on uh, cash reserves for the big uh, e-payment companies e-wallet companies like your Alipay and what and your WeChat Pay right and also back to the, just to cap the point back to the foreign reserve thing they have a lot of huge reserves uh, uh, very small amount of reserves and they have a lot of huge exports last year but mm. despite that reserves never grew so I won't go into the detail. But basically, when you have a lot of exports, you should have a lot of reserves, right? Increase in reserves. So the natural skeptical assumption is that they have been deliberately not increasing their reserves because when you do that, it strengthens your yuan, right? Your RMB. And uh, uh, obviously, because the economy is still very reliant on exporters, right? If you strengthen your yuan, you hit your exporters hard. Right. In Correct. fact, the exporters have already been complaining in the news about it. 
So they got to strike a very fine balance. They are between a rock and a hard place, right? And um, even at that communist economy level, they are just not in a healthy spot right now. Understand. Okay. Yeah. The Understand. risks are very high. Okay, so that's China. Let's go to the US. Well, what, so what's happening right now that you see? And then we we'll okay. go to Malaysia last after that. Correct. All right, sure. So in the US, um, okay, I think if you've been following the political news in the US, right, uh, what you will actually observe is that uh, Biden is uh, pushing a very progressive policy, right? He is trying to basically help the small guy right, at the expense of the big companies. So he's coming, going after the technology companies for legitimate reasons, but the fact is that he's going after them, right? As opposed to Trump who was doing the complete opposite, giving tax cuts. And then also there is this narrative, bilateral uh, narrative in Congress about being hard against China. So right in, in the Trump era, um, it was just US against China. Now it's the US and all its allies against China. It's the Western bloc against China, right? But you yeah. include like the guys like South Korea and Japan and or well, Taiwan's obviously there, India, because I know that um, China has been pretty aggressive in its language, uh, maybe even in, in its actions. So, and then, you know, with, with what they've done with COVID, essentially, they, I don't think they can overturn the narrative that it is, uh, it is it, either it originates from China or the widespread uh, increase of cases have started in China and then they didn't stop the the cross border or cross country uh, travel right. So will you include some of the other uh, non European uh, non Western nations as well? Oh, definitely. So so uh, so I can actually go into a breakdown of it. Taiwan obviously they depend on US for support military support. Japan is definitely on the US side as well. Uh, South Korea does have to play a balance because its priority is North Korea, not the US, right? So, um, but having said that, as far as what they want to do, if they had a choice, they would want to ally with the US rather than China. So, um, uh, India, India is definitely allied with, with the US, right? They have skirmishes with China on the border. Uh, I would say that as far as, okay, so to, to really answer your question, you can invert it by saying what who are China's allies. It will really be the uh the Middle Asian guys, right? Your Turkmenistan, your Kazakhstan, your Eastern European guys, right? Who will benefit from trade between China and Europe, as well as Africa, right? What about and Russia? Of, Russia. That one that one goes without saying, right? Yeah. That's like asking is is Canada allied with US? Well, US. <laughs> no, but, but 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 I do feel that historically is a bit different because I, I think it's it's been very very real politic with Russia la. <clears throat> because we have to remember that China in a way backstab Russia yeah uh, Mao, Mao backstab Russia back in the day so I, I don't think they're not Canadians la. <laughs> Russians are not Canadians yeah no obviously it's not an apples to apples comparison yeah. but they are both from a communist background so they actually uh so where they actually have a real, you know, there's a saying, the enemy of the, the enemy of my enemy is your, my friend, right? So Russia is US enemy, ma. China is also US enemy. Ma. So friend, ma, they need each other. And you keep in mind if there's a war, right? If let's say US tries to invade China, right? Or ring fence it and do an embargo or something. Uh, they can't, right? The reason being that uh, Russia will supply all the oil and food they will ever need for the next 50 years. So they need Russia as a friend, right? They definitely want to keep them happy, right? Uh, just as a backup. Lah. As well as ASEAN, right? If you've been noticing in Malaysia, you've actually seen a lot of uh, warm handshakes, right? From China, DNX coming in, and then, you know, your Honhai coming in, right? So, um, uh, and then your ECRL involvement, you know, what else? I, I could, your, your ports, right? So, um, they, it's really, you know, can boil down to the OBOR strategy, the one belt, one road strategy, uh, where they are trying to create a geopolitical ties, right? But China does have that South China Sea problem with ASEAN and uh, the nine dotted line, right? And uh, yeah. here's the thing. 
The US has restored the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, yes, in yes. the form of the Build Back World, Build Back Better World, B- B3W, right? So if the US can give me the same power of gold, why do I want to bother with China? Yeah, and I, I also think that, you know, tying to our discussion earlier on about, uh, what's that, uh, about ASEAN story, which is actually Vietnam is kind of spearheading it. Um, I don't know if you know this, John, it's a cool fact for you. The entirety, when they teach Vietnamese children, Mm-hmm. Uh, the entirety of their history, right, is how uh, China dominated them. There's like <laughs> the first Chinese domination, the second Chinese domination, the third <laughs> Chinese domination. And I find it very interesting that uh, in 2014, I remember Barack Obama actually visited Vietnam. And then he's eating fur at the side of the road. I'm just thinking, my goodness, just 30 or 40 years ago, these guys were throwing napalm bombs at bombs, each other. Yeah. But now yeah. they are friends. But in the history books, they still hate China. So I just thought I'd just add that fact in it, right it, now. It, talk about indoctrination, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's very funny. Now they are best friends for the US and, yeah. and, China, uh, and, and Vietnam. Yeah, anyway, so, sorry. Yeah, I just want to add that in. Continue, uh, Aaron. Uh, yeah, so basically... Oh, we were actually talking about the US, right? <laughs> so no, the US overtures and the Trans-Pacific yeah. Agreement. Trans-Pacific, yeah, 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 correct. So this also answers, ties back to your earlier question about uh, Congress having bilateral agreement to be hard on China, right? And as well, in the US, you also really want to look at the, at the debt issue. So we are in the late stages of a credit super cycle, right? So go and watch this video by Ray Dalio, how the economy works. It tells you how the, super cycle, the credit super cycle works. Basically, right now, we're at a tipping point in the global terms, um, um, the likes of prior to 1929, before the Great Depression, right? The only difference is that uh, in 1929, the government took a hands-off approach. That's why it became a 10-year-long recession. Whereas in 2000, 2020, we did the complete opposite, right? We, yeah. we basically supported the whole global economy with central bank policy. So um, um, right now, the debt is not in a comfortable position either. There's something like 28 trillion of debt. Right, and the uh, central bank's balance sheet has grown to just cross eight trillion, I think, a few days ago. So, uh, the implication is that they are monetizing debt, right? Which means you are basically playing God with the economy because what you are doing is disturbing the natural order of things, right? Instead of allowing, uh, uh, bad companies to go bankrupt and let the economy heal, yeah. you are supporting up all the zombie companies, right? So. And these companies with the high debt, they can still go bust anytime, which will tank your economy anyway. Yeah. So you are basically repeating Japan, right? The, the lost decades of Japan. And also why they are doing CBDC so aggressively, right? The whole world is doing it. Because if you want to further stimulate your economy and you are already at 0% interest rates, you need to take it down a negative. And why is CBDC relevant? Because when you have a digital paper, uh, currency as opposed to a paper currency, you cannot go and withdraw all your money and put it under your mattress, right? Or in a billionaire's yeah. case, put it in a big warehouse, right? With insurance, uh. So, uh, bank runs are really what you're referring to is that you can't do bank runs, okay? Yeah. So you are forced to tank that that negative interest rate, right? Which means that they can take the interest rate to negative. Uh, so, uh, that really seems to be the only way out. I mean, for us to consider negative interest rates, everything else has to be worse, right? Right. So we are really in a new paradigm of money, the likes of getting leave, being abandoning the gold standard in the seventies. And and that's interesting that you brought up CBDC and 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 the new way of monetary policy. I don't think what what do you think about the economic rules that you know uh, the likes of Menard Keys and all that? Uh, do they still apply today, or do you think new rules need to be rewritten about how uh, economic uh, parameters should be measured? <laughs> Correct. So, uh, Keyn- Keynesian economics, right? John Maynard Keynes' uh, mm. counter-cyclical fiscal policy, which is the the ben- the standard, uh, what we re- really think about, remember him for, is basically that you you save up during good times and then you spend it during bad times, right? To stimulate the economy, and you save it again, as opposed to nineteen twenty nine, where you don't do anything, you just let the market be organic. Um, the problem is that human politics doesn't work that way, right? Because your election is once every four years, your market cycle is typically about ten years. So in order to win the election, you gotta start stimulating the economy in the two-year mark. So you never actually pay down the debt, right? So the one guy who has actually done this really well is Australia, 
That's why during the 2008 crisis, they never had a recession, right? Whereas, you know, for US and Malaysia and basically every other country in the world, um, you, 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 you spend during bad times, but you don't save during good time. During good time, you spend more, right? You go and build your ECI, you go build MRT, right? <laughs> and then when the, when the next bad time comes, you spend again. So you, instead of having a nice market cycle, you have a super cycle. You distort, right? uh, you distort the cycle, uh, basically. Yeah. And you know, you want to recover when the, when the super cycle explodes and goes all the way back to zero, you want to come back from that. It's not so easy. You know? So, right. are we... So we are essentially eight years away from the 1929 100-year anniversary, right? <laughs> and I, you know, you brought up Ray Dalio just now. So he did mention that it's starting to look like the 1930s with uh, the rise of uh, populism, of inequality, uh, traditional geopolitics conflicts right uh, in the past it's mainly US led everyone is friend if they are not friends the US just take both their heads and just smash it together and say you know work together right I mean Japan and Korean relationships are like an all time high I mean they don't love each other don't get me wrong but they, you know it's still good but then you're seeing areas like uh, Russia doing what they did with Crimea, Crimea China openly you know basically taking land in the South China Sea and then there's a whole lot of things you know the EU potentially disintegrating. So in your view, do you agree with Ray Dalio's view that it is starting to look like the 30s? Okay, I'm going to leave up my phone for... Okay. Okay, sure. So, um, sorry, what's the question again? Can you repeat it? Yeah, is it the uh, is it the thirties basically? Okay. So, um, no, what you say is true in the sense that normally when the economics break down, you will start getting a war, right? And then the the winner will subsume the loser, and it will restore the economic balance. But because the U.S. is in the military hegemony right now. Uh, you can't do that, which is why we are even at zero percent interest rates at the moment. So, um, uh, that is why I think America is taking such a hard stance on China because if it ever becomes a military challenger to the U.S., you could easily see a new World War Three or Cold War springing up. Um, I would say that. Uh, okay. I wouldn't draw an apples to apples comparison of the 30s because uh, at the time you had Germany, you had Britain you and had, Germany basically, right? This other, yeah. You basically had a military contender, right? And the strongman uh, was able to rise up to counter uh, the the military might of the US uh, or rather the, the, the economic uh, superpowers at the time. Whereas today you don't really have that uh, military situation but in terms of economics um, I think it's very similar okay we are at that credit cycle right and also uh, the the build back better initiatives by uh, by Biden is very is a mirror image of the the new deal policies of uh, Franklin Franklin Roosevelt right, right. At the time. so um um, we really the, the difference is this right uh, we do not have any more land wealth to conquer in the world right we basically have, have already saturated all borders and the US has a policy of not not you know co colonizing other people whereas prior to World War II that option was still available so that right. is why I think they are even considering CBDC right because 
you do need to have a backup plan in case we have another Black Swan event, right? But right. Um, as far as your distance are concerned, I wouldn't say it's apples to apples, but definitely okay. there are a lot of similarities. All right, all right. So we got to wrap up. Um, and of course, we are all Malaysian. So, uh, you know, just a short explanation on... Basically, are you still positive about Malaysia or, or negative, you know, with all that's going around? Yeah, sure. So actually, uh, I'm, I, I, I can empathize with the average Malaysian who is, uh, who is depressed at the state of our politics at the moment. But I would recommend them to go to Wikipedia and read all the political, Malaysia, all the Wikipedia articles about Malaysian politics, right, which have been vetted and, um, you know, basically uh, are as objective as you can get on the internet, right, uh, from independence until today. What you will realize is that every decade we have some super mega uh, problem event, right? So in the 60s, we had the 1969 racial riots. Of course. In the 70s, we had um, West Malaysia, you know, taking the rights of East Malaysia, as well as NEP, right? In the 80s, you had Maite's fight with the judiciary and the 1980s economic crisis when, uh, because we borrowed too much from Japan, right, to basically do what uh, the, the Look East was. policy and all that. La. Correct, the collapse of the Look East policy. 1990s, we had the Asian financial crisis. Oh, not to mention in the 80s, we had the Razale and Mahathir schism. 90s, we had like, the Asian financial crisis as well as the Anwar uh, and Mahathir financial, uh, Anwar Mahathir schism. Um, 2010s, we had, um, yeah, you know the 2010s, right? Yeah. When so, was the Ming, Ming Court scandal? Uh? Ming Court scandal was the 90s, right? Or was it the 80s? In fact, we had the Bank Bumi Putra scandal in the 80s, right? Yeah. Which is very similar to what's going on today. Yeah. So I would say that if we manage to survive since then, we should survive today as well. Lah. You know, all right, these two shall pass, lah, right? The probability of these two shall pass. Uh, and the economics from Malaysia is very good. So maybe take your eyes a bit off of the, what would you call that? The politicians. Look at our regulators, right? Look at, SC, Bank Negara, as well as Bursa Malaysia, they are very people worthy of our respect, right? Even EPF yeah, I, and all that as well, I would say. Yeah, true. EPF as well. So, uh, you can also visit my interview with uh, another blogger by the name of Michael Fritzl, where I read the article. You can actually see, I describe it in detail there, where uh, I have a lot of respect for our regulators for our infrastructure, right? Our ease of doing business here is phenomenal compared to the rest of the ASEAN countries. And you think about our, even our politics, right? Um, Vietnam, right? Your, comp- your business can be nationalized anytime, you know, right? Indonesia, you gotta pay a bribe to get anything done. Thailand, you have your yellow shirt and red shirt, so no foreign business will step there. Or at least, like, will, will, will step there before, I mean, will think of building a permanent base of operations before in Malaysia. Myanmar goes without saying, mm. right? So, except for Singapore, we are second best in ASEAN already, right? So, in terms of politics, in terms of economics, we are, like, you want to apply for a business permit, just go to your nearby, what, MPPJ and go and apply, right? Yeah. Or even can do it online now. You even have MyEG helping you for a fee. So, if you compare to the US, sure, right? We suck. But if you compare to the rest of ASEAN, we are basically the US already. Right. Yeah, that, that I think with that, yeah, it's an excellent uh, end <laughs> to the podcast. I, that's very good. We are the we are the ASEAN US. I will always remember <laughs> that. I, I'm gonna put it in the thumbnails. Yeah. The ASEAN US Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank you so much, uh, Aaron, for being on the podcast. I think it's time for lunch. Uh, we're all very hungry, and uh, so um, definitely looking forward uh, to part two, perhaps. And yeah, before we go, how how can people find you? You know. Yeah, sure. Just reach out to me on my LinkedIn. Uh, or on my blog, right? Um, I'm 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 happy to talk. If you are truly genuine about becoming a value investor, you know, I just like to be your friend, right? Oh. Because we just don't have enough of them here in Malaysia. It's a it's a it's a rare species, right? Yeah, that's that's why we are so close, right? Yeah, Three of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and with that, guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. I learned a lot. Uh, if I would summarize, I don't know how John, how would you summarize? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great way to spend a a morning, lah. I'll put yeah, it this way. Great yeah, way to spend yeah. a morning. And, and Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Yep. We really appreciate you coming on. 
Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. I'm more than happy to do this. It's right. it's fun to always talk with value investors. Yeah, and I hope right. we can have more of them going forward. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, if you enjoy, of course, if you're YouTube, remember to like, comment, subscribe, uh, follow us on Spotify, and uh, you know, see you in the next podcast. Bye bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.